following is brought to you by Severn Christian Church, a family church where your life matters. Thanks for having me. Uh, a lot has happened since I was with you last uh, in June. Uh, on July 4th, while you were celebrating the birthday of America, my wife and I were celebrating survival. We survived the years as parents of teenagers. The baby turned 20. And then just a few, a couple weeks after that, the firstborn brought us a daughter-in-law. So, so now we're in-laws. And I mentioned somebody, I said, we want to make sure we're in-laws, not outlaws. I said, no, nah, you might want to be outlaws because outlaws get visited. <laughs> so who knows? I grew up in a little town in central Pennsylvania. And in my growing up years, my dad was always a diesel mechanic. He retired from rider truck. Uh, not the rental part of it, but where the big rigs were, uh, he he worked on those. While I was uh, growing up, um, my mother was a stay-at-home mom, as long as I can remember. Although I had four older siblings, most of my growing up years were with my brother Casey, uh, as many of you know him. Um, there's a lot of years in between Casey and our older siblings. We kind of had two families, the older three and then Casey and I. And just for the record, Casey and I have given mom more grandchildren than the older three. So that should work out. But uh, all in our growing up years, mom just kind of took care of us. She did have some seasonal work at a, at a, a nursery, a plant nursery uh, that was close to home. She would cook in our, during the summer at our local church camp. But I tell you all that because I grew up in the a solid middle class family. And church was central uh, to mom and Casey and, and I and my father's mother and not so much dad in the younger years, but thank God he came around to the Lord uh, near the end of his life. But, but anyway, they, they kept me under the influence of the church and, and encouraged me to have a relationship with the Lord. And so under the influence of the church, you quickly, well, maybe not quickly, but you learn that everything you have is the Lord's. Very, and, and, and it's, they, they encouraged me that way, and, it, and they taught me how important it was to recognize the fact that God owns it all by giving back to Him, as you just did during the offering time. And so, even as I've grown into adulthood and, and married, my wife and I have always budgeted and line items, and I always held the power of veto, line item veto, no, that's not, but line one was always our tithe and offering. It always, no matter how, <laughs> how things were going, lots of money, not so much money, it always came off to the Lord first. And so here I am, decades, Past when my big brother Will baptized me into Christ in in, in the Marsh Creek, and uh, decades past taking on a bride, and here's what I found out: through all those years and all those experiences, I found that God is always faithful. He's never let us down, even when finances have been tight. We've always given to the Lord, and He's always supplied our needs. 
So I think we all, and I've had to do this, we've all have to come to grips with Jesus. And we have to answer the question, is he faithful or not? And I would say in a crowd like this, we would never say that Jesus is unfaithful to us. But sometimes our lives during the week tell us a different story. You think about the way you have lived throughout this week and then how you're living today. Is it any different? The way you have talked during the week. The way you talk today. Is it any different? It shouldn't be. And so... One key area that really shows what kind of a relationship we have with the Lord and whether or not we trust Him is in our finances. In fact, I'm only aware of one area in the Bible where God says, test me. It's in Malachi, and it's in the area of giving. Test me. See if I won't open the gates of heaven as you give the tithe back to Him. And so it probably goes without saying that it's a wise thing to honor God with our, with our financial giving. And so I want to get into the book of wisdom, the Proverbs. I want to show you a few verses that, that speak to that. And as I was studying, I, I came to the conclusion that um, the Proverbs really talk about God's concern for the poor among us. And so we'll get into that, but... But before we do, I, I just want to investigate with you real quick some, some motivations of, for giving. Why, why do we give? Why do we pass these offering bags every week? Why do we have a, a, a teaching on, on financial stewardship and financial giving? Well, there's several motivations. And if I had a, a ladder here, I would, I would rank them from the bottom <laughs> motivation to the highest motivation. And uh, as you can see there on, on the, uh, that slide. And so the lowest rung of that ladder would be guilt giving. And a lot of of religious giving is spurred on by guilt. You know, they make you feel bad if you don't give. They make you, you're a lesser person if you don't give a certain amount. Oh, you're really great because you give a great amount. I'm telling you right now, that is not a biblical motivation for giving. Guilt is not in the Bible uh, for giving. There's There's the motivation that we give to get something. Now, granted, God g- does promise that if we give, He blesses us. However, it may not be in ways that we think. <laughs> you know, we may give our money. God may bless us in another way, which is just in, important. How about needs giving? People only give if they see a need. That's admirable to give when you see a need, but that's not a high motivation because it is dependent on your subjective view of what is a need. You may, something may be a need, you may not see it as a need, so you don't give. And thanksgiving. <laughs> yes, people give when they feel thankful, but what if I don't feel thankful? What's that going to do to my giving? Probably reduce it. No, the highest motivation for giving is in worship. You give to worship. I've seen, I've heard of people who have withheld their tithe and their offering on Sunday morning because they disagreed with a, with a decision of church leadership. I'm telling you right now, if you have done that, you have been disobedient to your God. Because when you give your offering, you don't give it to the church leadership. You don't give it to the evangelists. You don't give it to the elders. You give it as an act of worship. You give it to God. God has appointed Leaders in the church, they'll be held accountable for that. But you do not withhold your offerings to your God because of a leadership decision. That's not, that's not good. And so we give recognizing the gracious hand of the, of the Lord. And, and so when we help the poor, it should first be an act of worship to God. And then if it results in thanksgiving or a need is, is met, uh, that's great, but that's secondary. Worship to God is first. Now, having said that, I want you to consider Proverbs 19 and verse 17. We're going to look at a couple of verses in Proverbs 19. The Bible says, One 
who is gracious to the poor, uh, to the poor man. Well, actually, let me yeah, let me stay here. Uh, lends to the Lord, and He will repay him for his good deed. So when you tithe, or you give to a homeless shelter, or you serve at a food pantry, or you help a needy family, you're actually lending to the Lord. And when you lend to somebody, you expect to get back, right? And God's faithful in that. But what if it's a way that's not clear to us? What if it's a way that that is totally different than what we were expecting? I mean, God, I gave this money. I was hoping to get more money back. Reminded me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those three boys, those three Hebrew boys? They uh, were facing certain execution. And I love what they said when they were getting ready to be thrown into a fiery furnace. They said, uh, we'll always worship God, basically. That's what they said. You know, We fully expect Him to deliver us. But if He doesn't deliver us, we'll still worship Him. What if God, we give to God expecting a certain thing, and we don't get that certain thing, do we still worship Him? We should. Because he's God. How about when it comes to relating to people? Well, the Bible says that being generous helps in our relationship with other people. Back in verse 6 of of Proverbs 19, many will seek the favor of a generous man. And every man is a friend of him who gives gifts. For some reason, I enjoy one of the, the movies I watch every year at Christmas time is a Christmas Carol. I love George C. Scott as uh, Scrooge. You remember uh, the character of, of Scrooge? And incidentally, just n- means nothing, but um, a couple years ago, I went to, or maybe it was last year, a couple years ago, I went to hear the one-man show of A Christmas Carol by the great-great-grandson of the man who wrote A Christmas Carol. But, so anyway, you remember Scrooge? Scrooge was an old miser. When it came to finances, he was tighter than bark on a tree, wasn't he? Nobody liked him. They liked his money, uh, but uh, they didn't seek his company. And so he's a lonely man until he had this epiphany of sorts. And he went from being a miser to one of the most generous men in town. And his life was better for it. Now, as we looked at these two verses in Proverbs 19, It took me to the teaching of Jesus on the greatest commandment. Now stay with me in this, and I think uh, the point will be be clear. In Matthew 22, uh, Jesus was asked about this. Uh, Beginning with verse 36, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends the whole law and prophets. Now, the teaching can be summed up this way. Love God and love people. Love God, love people. Now, apply that to our giving. Wise giving is, first of all, worship to God. So we love God. God through our giving and as an act of worship. And second, it helps people. It helps people come to know Jesus as the Savior, helps them in other ways as well. And so it, it, it's loving people. So our giving lo- helps us love God, helps us love people. Now there's another proverb in chapter 22 that shows the wisdom of giving. 22 verse 9 is where it says, he who is generous will be blessed for he gives some of his food uh, to the poor. It's a simple law of the harvest. All right. How many of you planted the garden this summer? How'd it do? Did it do pretty good? Could have gone all right. We've had some rain and haven't heard of too much drought condition this year, but you plant a little bit, how much are you going to harvest? A little bit. You plant a lot, how much are you going to harvest? A lot. And so that's what God's teaching us, the simple law of the harvest. If you're generous, you're going to be blessed. Now, near the end of the Apostle Paul's life, he was getting ready to uh, meet with the beloved elders of of the church in Ephesus. 
And he tells them in that final conversation of something he learned from Jesus. Something that the four gospel writers didn't mention that Jesus taught. But here's what he said. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, studies show that givers are some of the happiest people around. There was a uh, survey of 30,000 American households that found out that people who give money to charity were 43% more likely than non-givers to say they were very happy about their life. (laughs) And so the blessings are far more than just the money, far more than the finances. I don't know how many times I've asked people, and and particularly... uh, uh, I try to bring it up in premarital counseling. What would you rather have? Would you rather have all the money you could possibly want and have chaos in your home? Or would you have like to have just enough money and have peace in your home? Almost 100% of the time, people say, I'll take the peace. Why is that? The wisdom of giving. If we... Uh, Define wisdom as knowledge applied. What do we know? Well, we know that God is good. We know that He owns it all. We know that God is generous with us. And we know that we can be generous in our giving. What would happen if we'd be generous? like the people in the Bible, particularly the people in, the, in Macedonia, the Christians of Macedonia. We read about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. Paul's trying to teach the Corinthian church. He says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation and support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. (laughs) Did you get that? Deep poverty. I grew up middle class and I've had enough. I don't know. I've never experienced deep poverty. But the people of Macedonia did. And they still were liberal in their giving. That's one area I always want to be called a liberal. (laughs) Is in my giving. Even when the means are lean, if the Lord is the priority, you can still give generously. But notice they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. How do you do that? How do you give yourself first to the Lord? Well, Jesus said it happens this way. You deny yourself. You take up your cross daily. (laughs) And you follow me. In the book of Acts, we see that played out. We deny our, uh, deny ourselves, and we depend on the Lord. Our faith is in the Lord; it's not in us. We deny ourselves. What? How's that look? Well, say for instance, we want something, but we know the Bible says God wants something different from us. When we say, "Okay, God will do it your way," we have denied ourselves. Take up your cross. Now, today's, in today's world, we have shirts with crosses on them. We have necklaces with crosses on them. But I'm telling you, the cross, that, nothing wrong with those getting. But the cross that Jesus is talking about, there's no comfortable way to carry that kind of cross. So we're always looking for easy street in the Christian life. And I'm telling you, there's, it's not there. <laughs> no such thing as easy street living the Christian life. 
We take up our cross, and in the book of Acts, we see people repenting of sin, dying to an old way of life. Because what, what's repentance? It's a turning. Before we became a Christian, sin was our lifestyle. And so we make a decision to, to die to that old way of, of life. And so the best thing to do with a dead person is to bury them. <laughs> And so we follow Jesus into the waters of baptism where that old life is, is stripped away from us and a new life is brought in. We rise to walk in newness of life and the Holy Spirit comes and takes residency in us that helps us live the life that Jesus wants us to live. And then we spend the rest of our days following the Word of God, living according to His commandments, living according to His principles, living according to his philosophy. Not the world's commands, not the world's principles, not the world's philosophy. They will take you down a wrong road. <laughs> but God will lead you to his throne. And so this morning I want to urge you to give yourself first to the Lord. First and foremost. Always, always the priority in your life. But always remember, he doesn't want first priority in your life. <laughs> he wants every priority in your life. He wants to be as much as part as priority number 12 as he was priority number one. You get the idea? It's an all-encompassing relationship that you have with the Lord. There's not a bit of your life outside of his realm. Not, not outside... Not a bit of it outside of his influence. It's all or nothing. So give yourself first to the Lord. Let's pray and then we'll, the band will come and, and I think a familiar face will be here. We'll, if you need to come to the Lord, somebody will be here to welcome you. We certainly hope that you'll do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, forgive us when we blamed you for, for things. Crying that we don't, that somehow you have dealt unfairly with us. But God, help us to know that you, in your love nature, are always a good, good God. And you can do nothing but good. You can give us nothing but good in our life. The problem is perspective. We know that, God, that we don't see what you see, and sometimes we think that things are bad when they're actually working out for our good. So God, help us to trust you, because you see all, and you know all. We know nothing. God, give us that total trust in you, our good, good Father. For we pray in the name of your good Son, Jesus.